everyone. Welcome. This is another To Debate podcast, another podcast episode. And today we have a brand new motion because we still have not exhausted all our themes to debate. Uh, I am currently in Sri Lanka. It's 8 p.m. almost. And Dirk, you're in Germany. As always, you have such a terrible life, Sebastian. Sri Lanka. Okay, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Before you talk about a miserable, miserable life, Let me just uh, remind a few facts. What is the uh, temperature in Celsius right now in Germany? Uh, well, let's above. say seven, eight. It's warm. Uh, it's above freezing warm, temperature. Warm? Okay. The definition of warmth in Germany is seven degrees Celsius. Just add 20 degrees Celsius more. You're in Sri Lanka. Ah, okay. okay. Now let's talk about who's so, miserable. So how many stars with how many stars would you rate the weather in Sri Lanka then? That's a nice transition. And the reason why I'm not answering that question is because the motion today is rating everything is toxic. The flip of the coin, as usual, has decided who will be for and against. And in this case, I will be against that motion. Uh, that is, I will defend the fact that it's worth it to rate everything. And I will be second in this debate. So whenever you're ready, Dirk. Yeah, and by rating, yours. by rating, we mean the typical five star thing, right? The oh yeah, this this cab ride was uh, worth five stars, or this hotel in which you're staying in Sri Lanka is worth two and a half stars, or what yes. have you? <laughs> yeah. As opposed to what? Because you you were saying we're talking about this as opposed to something. You have something uh, I just mind? learned from one of the the other debates that a definition in the beginning is important, right? <laughs> yes, we had a, a very in depth uh, a comment from one of our listeners on our uh, debate about consumer drones that we published just two weeks ago or three weeks ago. Um, but that was very actually very insightful. Uh, it was uh, it's funny. It's uh, how we can, I guess. Uh, How do you say in English? Um, struck the the wrong nerve uh, on uh, on some of our fans who are way more experts than we are on some of these topics as we try to cover a wide range of topics. Also, we actually debated one time, can't remember when exactly, but about grading grading students. Remember? Yeah. We debated about this, so I guess we may not cover this today because we already had that debate about whether it was worth it to grade students. Uh, or not. So today is about rating the kind of Uber, Yelp, restaurants, hotels, what have you, uh, people. Yep. Who knows? That's it. So whenever you want, you have your two minutes and I will listen carefully and patiently to see if you have any valid argument. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues for the motion. Some of our listeners may remember There was a time before the internet, and you might also remember that ratings have been around already back then. So ratings are nothing new. So what we debate today is not that rating is bad, so as a, as a whole concept. What we're going to debate is that rating everything by everyone is a problem when driven to the extreme. Why so? The short answer, it ultimately forces us into compliance. There's a British show called Black Mirror. Some of our listeners may have watched episodes from it. And that had one, one episode that was, um, well, basically presenting a whole dystopia around rating everything and everyone. So people were basically using ratings as a social currency. And we have a real world example right now of a place on this planet where this is put to the test. China is putting it into practice right now. When everybody rates everything and everyone else, then the problem is that your freedom and value in the world becomes governed by that particular score. It becomes a currency of sorts, what rating you have. And we see this today already. The Uber driver that refuses to take you for a ride if you have less than five stars as a passenger is an excellent example. And this is happening, maybe not with five stars, but there are people having something like 4.6 or 4.5 stars that sometimes wonder why their rides are canceled. In a world where you depend on some online tool to catch a ride, This becomes a problem. Now, you may say, if you misbehave, then you deserve this rating and the consequence, but that discount affects like African-Americans that score lower, people with certain disabilities who also score lower, certain cultures scoring lower, the list goes on. So in the end, the scoring is biased. It forces 
enforces and uh, unleashes biases, forces everyone into compliance in the end, and is nothing less than the end of freedom as a whole. Remind me, how do you choose which doctor, which hotel you want to go to? Exactly. You ask family, friends, or maybe you go to an online website which gives you some rating about whatever you want to use anywhere. Even doctors, as you said, it's nothing new. In the past, even before the internet, we went to see a doctor, a lawyer, uh, based on their reputation, even knowing who to marry, maybe. After consulting friends, families, acquaintances, companies have customer satisfaction scores, and it's useful data. I mean, I never go on a date with a woman whose Uber rating is indeed below 4.7. And I think I mentioned this in an older episode, but this is absolutely true. And I should have known this before. I would have saved years of my life in stupid arguments with uh, maybe one of the women who I, don't, I have no idea if she's listening to this show, but I've baptized her toxic woman. If I had known her Uber rating, I would have avoided that. It sums up that rating, how people behaved in the past. And it gives us a prediction of how likely they're going to behave in the future. And the most attractive element is that it puts indeed that pressure to maintain a desirable reputation, to be nice in something they may not feel compelled to be or to do otherwise. And peer-to-peer -peer is not economy, is not just fueled by technology and these apps, but also on trust. And how can you have trust with someone you don't know at all, a total stranger? Mm -hmm. The only way to have this trust element is by having some form of rating, some form of an assessment, so you can guess how the transaction is going to evolve. We're always judging others, I think whether we like it or not. Putting a number or attributing a qualitative appreciation, I like or I don't like that person, is merely the same thing. I think it's something that we do naturally as human beings, we just love doing it, and saying you know what or who is better, it's a human thing. It's tightly correlated, in my opinion, to a sense of competition, of survival of the fittest. Look at how parents you know, compare their children to one another. Like, even if they don't admit it, of course, there's always a risk of misuse, of bias, but the benefits outweigh the risks. And anyway, humans want it psychologically, consciously or unconsciously. So no, rating everything is not toxic. It's something we're going to do anyway. So might as well have a structure and a methodology for it. Next up, Dirk. Let's hear his argument. How do I choose hotel doctors and what have you? By asking my family and friends. Exactly. I'm asking people I trust. And people I trust and I'm friends with and that around me, there is a lot of evidence that they are similar to me. They are usually more like me than foreigners. What comes into a social rating? Well... <laughs> Everything, everybody and her brother um, actually adds to that score. And many of these people are not like me and don't like the same things that I do like. It really comes down to things like hotel ratings and doctors to see the effect. Uh, I actually struggle with it. When I try to book a hotel in a place I have no knowledge about, I really struggle with the hotel rating because what does it tell me if somebody from, I don't know, Idaho with her boyfriend had a good time in a hotel that doesn't tell me if I'm going to have a good time in that hotel too because maybe my standards are different maybe my expectations are different so first off ratings are good if they come from people that are similar to me or like me and people I trust and at least our current systems don't support that at all. They are accumulation of pretty much everybody. Otherwise, you would open the door to really deep analysis of everybody's character. And we don't want to go that to, to that place in this debate, at least. But I, I would stand, uh, say this is actually not desirable. Second problem, fake ratings. It becomes so much of a currency these days that um, you cannot even trust ratings of doctors and uh, and hotels and restaurants anymore because they buy their ratings and also people tend to give ratings when they are extremely happy or extremely disappointed so it's not even that worthwhile i would argue so it's not really useful data if you base your dating decision on the uber rating fine uh, maybe then you date people that are more likable or know how to 
appear more likable uh, that that may be the case i wonder if you actually base your decision then on the right metric that's the next thing um, having metrics on on certain aspects of our behavior is not giving us a guarantee that we rate the right things or even rate the things we believe we rate so the the the, the surface observation that something was pleasant doesn't mean that the service actually was good um, to see that put to the test yeah well restaurants with uh, with chemicals that uh, increase the taste of food tend to rate higher than restaurants that actually give you the organic um, solid experience but maybe not that nice of an exterior and that nice uh, chemical enhancement of the taste so that the, the subjective ratings people give to, uh, or attached to services and goods are not exactly the same thing as really giving you a data insight into what is really good or bad. In the end, you build up pressure around certain types of behavior, and that really is my core argument against it. You try to force everybody in compliance if you if you're not allowing a way around. And when it comes down to it, when I book an Uber, I want to get from point A to point B. The guy doesn't need to talk with me. The guy doesn't need to smile at me. The guy, the job of the guy driving that Uber is to get me safely from point A to point B. And if he does that, then I'm satisfied there. And it shouldn't be an obligation for me to give a rating to a human being for providing that service, nor should it be an obligation for this guy to rate me as a passenger. Full stop. No, it's absolutely toxic to rate everything and everybody. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. No, there is no obligation for you or anyone to rate uh, something else. Uh, this is not what we're debating about, whether it's mandatory or not, uh, but whether you sh we should or there is value in rating everything. Uh, the driver of Uber or the passenger does not have to rate after the ride is completed. You can actually skip that step. Uh, and you mentioned you know, for some, someone who will not be accepted because their rating is lower. Well, you know, I don't think that prevents you from being nice indeed. Um, I think it's, we're not in this world anymore where the customer is king and can decide to be a jerk with whomever is providing a service. So unless the law obliges a company to serve all customers alike, then I don't think it's a bad thing to get people to be a little bit more, behave, uh, to behave a little bit better. You mentioned family and we can't rely on uh, anyone but family for trustworthy uh, ratings. Well, here's the thing: family or friends are not everywhere. When you know uh, when you need to go somewhere uh, on vacation and they have not been there, what do you do? So it's inevitable that you will have to turn to websites and to additional ratings and reviews. And here's the thing: it turns out no reputation is worse than a bad reputation. No reputation, no score is actually worse than having a negative review or rating. Diners are actually more prone to eating in a poorly rated restaurant than in a non-rated one. Recruiters are more likely to hire someone with a low number of LinkedIn endorsements than someone who is not on LinkedIn. And travelers are more inclined to book a poorly rated hotel, EntrepAdvisor, for instance, than a hotel that is not rated at all. So actually having these reviews are useful because they do influence decisions. And then you're going to say, as you said, but then they're not trustworthy. Well, here's the thing. We know how to read and I'm sure our listeners will relate to what I'm saying. When you have a one-star rating, a ne negative rating, well, you want to know more. You read the description on Amazon, on TripAdvisor. You try to understand. You try to uh, the, understand the details of that rating rather than just uh, satisfying yourself with a number or a star rating. Just like when you look at interview feedback, when you look at the interview feedback from candidates that we hire at Google, sometimes the interview feedback is poor, is poorly written. So we tend to discount and neglect what that interview was and how that interview, interview went. And we may ask for another interview to be conducted. So we do the same thing with hotels and doctors. We may actually read more and more reviews and descriptions to get a good understanding of what did the people like about this hotel, about that doctor, in more, uh, in more details than just a, a rating. Also, you mentioned people rating. Uh, here's the thing. It's interesting because I actually looked into this also. There was an app, or there is an app, rating people, but they U-turned. They stopped doing it because of legal implications if you actually rate people without their permission. So I feel there's no risk of uh, this misuse of rating because we have already legal frameworks in place. And it seems to be working. Like Companies are careful about what they can do or what they cannot do with ratings. And finally, I want to conclude with one thing that you did not touch upon, but I want to. it's an argument that, that you could have made, and I want to tackle it in anticipation, although we have one minute left. Instead of feeling miserable with ratings, 
uh, in case you get a bad rating. Actually use it as a tool to improve, a tool among other tools to make a better informed decisions about whatever you want to do, uh, whether it's a service you're providing. Learn what to benchmark against, avoid comparing with the impossible, the unreachable. So I think there's a lot of education to be had about metrics and reviews and ratings uh, rather than just throwing everything away. I think getting numbers is always useful. Final statements. Dirk goes first. Well, if you don't have friends and family around, you're forced to go to the web page and read ratings. No, Sebastian, you don't. You can go to a travel agency and have your uh, vacation booked there. There are plenty of ways to gather feedback. Um, I just happened to buy a set of fresh underwear last week. And it turns out the underwear that I bought has a rating on Amazon of three and a half stars. I can tell you that kind of underwear fits me perfectly well, but I can't start reading the reviews. I'm not convinced that this would provide me any clarity about uh, my underwear. So I think it's pretty stupid to rate everything. It's not providing the level of detail that I seek in my decision making process. And to the contrary, you actually said it. Having no rating is worse than having a bad rating. So in the end, I'm forced into accepting a world where I'm being rated. If I'm entering an Uber and I'm not breaking anything, I'm not swearing, I'm not stinking, I'm not vomiting into the car, what is the point then of giving me a rating? I book the service, I pay for it, I'm f okay friendly, I'm walking out of this and still the guy gives me something between one and five stars. That's not human dignity, that's not helping, that's not data points I can improve in. And certainly the African-American woman that tends to have a, a four-star rating where a white man or a white woman tends to have a five-star rating at Uber or Lyft has no way of taking anything useful out of that rating to improve on. No, it's toxic. We should stop that. Sebastian, let's hear it. Psychologically, we human beings cannot help but rating and comparing everything all the time. Even parents do this, comparing their children to the children of, of other parents. That does not mean we have to trust these ratings blindly. We can use these numbers, these reviews, these descriptions as one of the many tools we have to make a better decision. So saying it's toxic, it doesn't make sense in that sense. And finally, here's the thing, we would not engage with total strangers if we did not have some kind of assessment of description, of understanding of who that stranger is. And what better thing than a rating with a description, a review, an average of how that person is. And I am sure you have not been prevented from going into a taxi, Dirk. I will, I will take you on in the car. I'm sure you even have a recording of me driving you around. And I promise our listeners that you do not vomit in the car. So you're perfectly nice and friendly. So it, they can actually also take you. And they see they're going to listen to me. Now, thanks to me, you have a fantastic rating. People listen and I would like you even more. Anyway, no, rating everything is not toxic at all. It's something we can't, we can't help but doing. And it's even useful for anything that we want to engage in, in terms of transactions with total strangers, which is what happens to us every day of our life. So do I get a four star, a five star, or a three star rating for you? Well, here's the thing, I did not mention it during my, my little speech, but I honestly think people indeed, uh, at least for the Uber kind of rating, people get just get tired of rating, they just put five or one. They don't, I don't even think about it. Like, I don't want, the thing is, I don't want a driver to be expelled from the Uber thing just because he's not, I actually prefer if he's not, if he's not talking to me or if she's not talking to me. Like, I, I'm just that kind of passenger and I don't want to feel compelled. Initially, I wanted to be nice also. So I, I remain polite, but I don't engage in a conversation. I'm usually working or reading. So I, I think there's fatigue, as you said, also, like in terms of reading descriptions or even rating other things. So we do it whenever we think it's necessary. We, we're not obliged. So I think today the Uber thing, I, I would not be surprised the rating takes a different form in the future. That, in fact, anyway, you know, there's not going to be any, any car, but just self-driving cars. So there won't be any drivers. Sorry for the drivers today, but... You won't need any rating. It will just go away for the driving taxi service. Well, in terms of uh, data collection, by the way, uh, an interesting piece I read recently was Uber patented an algorithm giving you a score that signals how intoxicated you are. 
So based on your movement, I'm not sure if they actually use it, but the idea seemed to be that drivers get a, a little bit of a warning that they are about to pick up somebody who's drunk. And now we're getting into really a complicated territory, I would say. First off, I can it's not a stretch for me to imagine people that are not drunk, but uh, are picked up as a... As, a, uh, as an intoxicated person based on, I don't know, some disability, some medication or what have you, or because they are undersugared or whatnot. So so first off, it, uh, I'm not sure that this is an algorithm that actually is foolproof. Secondly, uh, now drivers are making the decision to pick you up or not based on what they believe uh, your, your, your situation is yeah. in. And this is this is terrible because in the end you're basically somebody who's calling you to basically be helped, uh, be transported, maybe refuse the ride based on data that's collected by them. So this is where on, this goes on. to. Okay, you can also. So this is the this, this is the pessimist uh, perspective. What about the optimistic perspective, which would be um, you can actually tailor a better offering, a more adapted offering, if you know that person has specific needs. For instance, the person is in a wheelchair. Not every, car, not every car can accommodate someone in a wheelchair. Someone who's going to vomit in, your, vomit in your car, maybe you need a special type of car where it's easy to clean inside, right? So, the, no, no, I'm, I don't know. Like, would you, would you want to carry someone in your car which is going to vomit? No. Like, I, I can understand a driver refusing someone who's likely to be drunk. But since Uber, since Uber, are, basically, Uber are basically private cars... So how many of these private cars are be equipped to be cleaned by, a, it, I don't know, on, uh, special equipment? It's not entirely true. Like, not all the car riding, uh, riding uh, services are just private cars. They're also taxis. Like the Uber partnership <laughs> in Southeast Asia. Fair enough. You can also order taxis. It, or special cars, by the way. Right? So I can imagine the, the flip side. And it's, it's a, it's a money-making machine. Uber has all incentive or Grab or whatever uh, or Gojek, all the cabs for all these companies. They have all the incentives in the world because they would have all these algorithms. It doesn't cost anything more to them. It's just adding features. So if you're drunk, if you're on the medication, if you're disabled, you can actually tell the service for them because it's just combining more data. So I yep. I mean, I can see the risk of misuse, but I can see also the, the positive side of it, which I actually ne never thought of before we did, had this discussion, by the way. Uh, which shows that there is value in, in, in dealing with special cases and corner cases, which may be a fraction of the entire industry, but the fraction of a multi-billion industry is still worth it. I, I have doubts that this is the reality we're going to see, but uh, yeah, um, maybe really? uh, you okay. have, as you say, there know. is a flip side. Um, right now... I'll, I'll give you an example. In Switzerland last year, I had to go, I felt so bad. I did not know how to kidney stone. Okay, I, I, I yelled in the train. And I asked for an ambulance. I could not even call it. And the ambulance cost me to do three kilometers or five kilometers. Can't remember. The ambulance cost me five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. If I had asked someone to call an Uber or a special Uber, like for my case, like I need to lie down or whatever, it would have cost me ten dollars, twenty dollars. Like I feel, like I still remember it a year a year down the road that it cost me five hundred dollars to do three kilometers. And in the end, there was nothing they could do. It's a kidney stone. But it, right? you, you, just, you this kind is of life. you 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 do see my point though, right? Because we can right now watch this whole thing playing out in action in China, where yes. they basically attach social scores to each and everyone, and you're basically getting punished for misbehaving. So all of a sudden, yes. So all of a sudden, you're not allowed to ride uh, first class in the train anymore because uh, you received too many parking tickets, and all of a sudden, um, you're not allowed to go to the good university because your behavior score in uh, in the the primary school was too low, and what have you so this is this is kind so of the dystopian downside of it i i agree and china is a very good example of what a dystopia could look like but china is a specific case i do think we have very good legal frameworks currently in most developed countries which granted is not the majority of the world i don't know every country's legal framework obviously but i i we have different different systems in place Right. And indeed, China or, or the way that you're de describing what's happening there is not a very good model from a privacy standpoint and what you could do with that data, undoubtedly. But I think we're shifting the debate from rating to how are, you, how are we how are you using that rating in the legal context? For instance, rating someone without user consent in most parts of Western Europe or all parts of Western Europe or the US would not be allowed. Right. There was an app which tried to do this and they actually, as I mentioned in, in my little speech, that they, they actually did a U-turn because they did not you know, want to mm -hmm. go into the legal implications of 
uh, of raiding people without their consent. So, so we have legal frameworks I mean, in place. I was surprised. I mean, the interesting piece is actually that there is no escaping, as you said. Uh, and it's going to the larger theme of uh, data analysis about people. Uh, the fact the fact that you're refusing to rate somebody is a signal in itself. So let's say you give everybody always five-star ratings. It's not really hard for an algorithm like uh, like the algorithm in Uber to basically discard your uh, your um, rating altogether or, or weight your occasional one-star rating higher because they know this is really something outstanding Agreed. or what have Agreed. you. So, and, <laughs> and that's the quality of the data. But as I mentioned, I think it's you use a combination of signals. Maybe some of these ratings will be useless, but they're not toxic. And and I want to I want to shift away. I, maybe I did not make the point very clear, but it's not because we have this natural itch to rate everything that it that it can also be toxic. We have this itch, but it could be toxic, which was your side of the motion. Uh, but I want to show that it's a psychological thing that we want to do, but it's also not toxic, which was the main point of the debate. And then the extension of this is the legal framework, which I don't think is also the debate. So I think there's multiple themes here, mm -hmm. which is the psychological aspect, which I touched upon a little bit, the legal aspect. And the central piece today was whether it's toxic or not. And I agree with you, a lot of that data is useless. Right. Does it make it toxic? I don't know. I think it's about education with data. And I would agree with you if you were to say, well, most people do not are not comfortable using metrics and data. They have like just look at the at the media in general. And I, I like the, the media. I'm not going to say I'm not going to say media is the enemy of the people as uh, one of our. Oh, we did not mention this guy today. I had to. I had to. Um, <laughs> but but journalists in general are not very good in using in using maths right? and using numbers and making sense out of them. So I, by extension, I think in, people just hate maths in general. So how good are you in manipulating data and making a, a very good informed decision? Probably not that great. I wish it were better. Whether that makes the rating toxic in itself, I don't know. Question is open to me. So in, in truth. Yeah, the, the, tox, the, the toxic element for me comes in because it drives behavior in a certain direction. And that direction is given by the kind of thing you can rate. And that limits human behavior and forces behavior. Let's take a let's take the example that you gave. You say say you don't date uh, um, women a second time that have a th below a certain threshold of Uber rating, or at least that's what you recommend, right? Um, that's what I recommend yeah, so for myself. That, yes, that absolutely. That probably gives you a guarantee to have a pleasant first and second date. It's not telling you anything, literally, about. The, the 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 qualification of that woman to be a long-term partner for you that makes you happy that's true but it tells me which ones i should not waste my time with i'll give you an example an example in a different world startups it's very difficult to know what makes startups succeed but it's very easy to tell which ones are going to fail one of the criteria is that they don't listen to their mentors to their advisors to their investors that's not me saying it that's that's the investors, that's the, stars, the, the tech hubs, the accelerators. So it's not because you ha you don't have a sign to tell you what is, that you, you, you don't have signals to tell you what is not. In the case of the Uber rating, trust me, ask your friends around you and you will see correlation between who's, who are the people you want to hang out with and the people who you don't want to hang out with. I'm sorry, toxic woman, if she's listening to this, but you, you she made me drop my Uber rating I know because from before and after the trip, well, it doesn't, it's not in, in, in live. I must have gotten a one because she was a bitch with a driver. And I said, no, your, my rating is going to fall. And it did fall, right? And anyway, so no, do not date. At least that's my personal advice. It does not guarantee that anyone who has a higher rating will give you a very fruitful and, and marriage and long-term relationship. But I know what I don't want to engage in. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making any universal truth out of this. It's just my personal experience. And, and again, to my point, it's about using one or multiple data points. You use the ones that, that you find relevant. It's just it's not toxic. Like it's, it, you know, it would be toxic if everyone was using just maybe one, one data point and that's it. And they, and they did all their decisions based on one thing. But actually, something I did not mention is that we're, we're assuming that ratings would be uh, self-reported by humans but actually in the decades to come 
it's very likely these ratings in good part would be automated yeah wonderful isn't that amazing uh, that's that's a vision <laughs> our our machine overlord will give us ratings and based on these <laughs> ratings we are not being no, picked up this, anymore this, this is the science fiction and movies but they get it And back to the point about overlords, I think this is the, the myth of uh, which is vehicled by science fiction movies, which I love, by the way, but I think they get it wrong. They imagine AI as if they're going to have, they confuse intelligence with consciousness. We can have another debate on that. But it's not because an AI is intelligent that it has a mind or a consciousness. We have no idea how con consciousness is being formed today. We know a lot about the brain, but we don't know about consciousness. So, and th these AI tools and robots for, for the foreseeable future, it may change in the centuries to come, but who can really predict? But in the foreseeable future, they're here to serve us, right? And however stupid we are as humans, we'll make a very stupid use of these robots and these AI tools that we're going to develop. So when I was half joking and not half joking actually about non-self-reported ratings and numbers and metrics, I'm thinking of things like, let's go back to the drunken thing or whether we're nice or not, but we could imagine a number of, I don't know, sensors within and outside our bodies, which could automatically detect in what mood, in what mood we are, and we could we could get recommendations or a specific driver. Oh, by the way, no driver because it will be self-driving car with someone who's adequately trained or designed psychologically to handle someone like Hugh Duck. That I can have a debate and win a debate. Every debate you win, and I'm just sick and tired of it. Please, listeners, rate <laughs> my motion. It's thumbs up today for me. No, it's thumbs down. Oh God, a thumbs down today. It's a double negative. Ratings are not toxic. Thumbs down. <laughs> and this wraps up the debate today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I won. I didn't win, but we have another debate to record. So, so thank you for listening. Thank you. Stay tuned for our next debate. Bye bye. Bye. Welcome everyone. This is another. Oh God! Why do I fail every time? That... Oh, God, I was struggling with my word. I was stumbling yeah, every single I mean, time. That's the most complicated part of the debate, right? It is. I think we're wasting the most time b before starting any podcast. Can you realize that? I think we spent like half an hour to an hour blabbing and talking about random shit. Then we, when it's time to get started, we f we fail every time. And then the second debate. The second time we record, like a second episode, goes much more smoothly Yeah, because we have the, the practice. Ooh, the big words. Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> I have hey, to dig Friday that. night. I'm still working tomorrow. It's late. Bear with me. Freedom. Okay, whatever. <laughs> My turn. My turn. Okay, nice ones. Nice arguments. Uh, that, it's not going to be easy for me, uh, but I'll do my intro anyway. And I'm not kidding. I looked up the rating of my underwear and it's three and a half stars. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure if I... Don't I, wanna, I, I don't want to know the details of when you're... In. I'm pretty sure if I look at that, there are probably even people who found the time to write reviews. They're, they're, Most certainly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I find plenty of them. I actually look at it right now. And to your point earlier, by the way, sometimes I even get review fatigue. If I read reviews of hotels at some point, it's not helping same. me at all. At some point, I'm doing, I'm taking the same random decision based on just the picture in the end because I, I Give me my minute. Give me my minute. Then we oh. discuss. Oh, I thought you had already. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get overexcited. 